Hi, I'm Jesper Peterson from KDAP. You're watching Programming with Qt and QML. We've now started on the very last section that you would find in a regular training with us. Well, it's actually from the supplementary topic of our training material where we ask the student, what are you especially interested in? This one is a very popular one, namely model view from C++. There is a reason why this is so popular, and that is because at the very, very first training day, the very first five minutes of the training, I tell people, like I told you, down here, that's where our, well, remember, that is where our business logic is. Up here, that's our presentation. If you have a clean separation between those two, it will be much nicer to work with your application. How do we get our business logic down there? Well, one of the key things for our business logic is whenever we have some data, and you will, I, I, can, I can really not imagine a, an application that doesn't have something with a repeated set of data. So in those situations, you will implement a model on the C++ side, and then you will have a list view or one of the other views on the QML side that will read that model. And the model will know how to access the real data. It could be that you had sensors throughout the world that was measuring something. It could be that you had a, a model that represented satellites flying around the globe. And in those cases, when the satellites fly around the globe, you really do not want to read all the data up front. You want to read the data as needed. And that's one of the key features of our model. I'm going to try here in very, very short time to tell you what usually would take almost a day in our training. So please buckle up. We're going to be doing just scratching this, the, the surface here. The API that you need to implement is that you need to subclass from Q abstract list model. This is for one dimensional list only. If you want trees, I'm sorry, there are no substitution for showing up in one of my scheduled trainings and listening to the whole one day version. But if you just want a simple list of things, then you will get by by subclassing Q abstract list model, implementing these two methods, int row count and Q variant data. Both of them takes a Q model index, and that is for the more generic version, namely the tree version. But when we're only talking about lists, then all we need to do for the for this version here, we'll just ignore it. And for the, the data version here, we just need to go to, into that index and ask, which row are you talking about? And then we got this display role that is basically asking, oh, what part of that row's data do you want? Do you want to know the name of the owner of that satellite? Do you know, want to know the color of that satellite? Do you want to know its geoposition, if such thing even exists in space? What is it you want to know? That's the, the role part. And as you can see, it returns a Q variant. If you haven't watched that episode in Q variant, now might be a good reason or good time for you to go back and watch that one. So you subclass from Q abstract item. Then you export that model into C++. If you don't know how to do that, there's also a video on that. So go back and watch that. Now, on this QML site, the QML side, you refer to the elements of the model. Remember the list view section? Also go and watch that one. You would say model.name, model.h, model.country of ownership, whatever. But they are all this name. So you need to map the name onto something that would fit into an integer. For that, you need, as the very first thing, to set up this virtual or this method role names. Uh, and the role names simply must return the mapping. So name role should be the name string. So we can go name, model.name, and that would map into the name role, which would then be this integer that we are given there. Similar flag into flag role, population into population role. And now on the QML side, you would simply use a list view just as you did with the, with the models that we had on the QML side. Model, my model, or well, I guess it should have been called underscore my model because now it comes from the C++ side. The delegate that you set up for your view, in here you will be referring to model.flag. Flag, that's this name that we have up there. Let me show you all of this in action. 
So let's run the application. Oh, sorry. Need to configure the project first. There we are. It takes three seconds. I don't know why. One, two, three. And now I can compile it and run it. And what you'll see is a number of flags. There we are. Number of flags. And next to the flags, there's the name and the population of that country. And well, stuff is happening in those uh, countries, it seems, because the population is, is growing all the time. Now, my model here is a C++ class. I export that set context property underscore my model. We saw that already in the previous videos on how we export objects from C++ to QML. So let's go and look at the my model, what it looks like. My model is subclassing from Q abstract list model. That's what we said. I'm implementing three virtual methods in row count, QRN data, and the row names here take, returning this mapping. I got an enum, so that's a classical thing that you will do in your, in your uh, applications there. My enum is roles, name role equal to Q colon colon user role. All this model view stuff is slightly arcane when you just jump into it from the QML side because it all is also used on the uh, on the widgets version of Q. So there we have the models, the widget view, the widgets list view will go to the model and say, can you give me the display role? Can you give me the uh, tooltip role and those things? But we don't use those, but we still will play nice and say, okay, we will not start with our own roles before QT colon colon user role, which is uh, 1024 or something like that, 0x100. Now, the that's my name role, flag role, and population role. So let's just look at the role names right away. The role names is exactly what we saw on the slide. We just need to set up this mapping from whenever we talk about the name, that means really the name role, flag means flag role, and so on. My count is the method that tells me how many items are in this model. Had this been about satellites flying around the Earth, and it would have taken me a substantial amount of time to reach out to each satellite and get their information, or about sensors on Earth measuring seismic activity or whatever, I do not want to go and read all that data up front. All I need to tell the list view upstairs is how many items do I have? Yes, I know I have 2,000 sensors. I'm not going to read them all. I'll tell you there's 2,000. You can come back if you want to know about a specific sensor, say the first sensor, the second sensor, the third sensor. Oh, you could only have three elements in your view. Oh, you asked for fourth and fifth because of the caching of the following element. But you will not ask beyond the fifth, especially not the sixth, up to the, the 2,000 sensors. So let's not go and fetch those until you actually need them. So my row count in this example, my data is located in this instance variable as a Q vector of data objects. And my data is just this simple data structure here that has a name for the country, the flag, and the population. So that's my that's my simple setup of the of the data here. My data object uh, or my data method is then returning the actual data. So if you come and ask for the name role, then I'll go to the data and return name. If you ask for the flag role, I'll return flag. If you ask for population role, I'll return population. And see, I just, up here, I said, okay, so you want to know this role here for this particular element. So index.row, that is the row that we're, that we're asking about. And I'll go to mdata and fetch that. If you're asking for something else, I'll just return you a Q variant saying, I don't know what you're talking about. If you come and ask me for data for an index that isn't valid, I don't know what you're talking about. So what you'll see in model view programming on the C++ level is that we play it safe quite a lot. If you ask for something I cannot answer, I will not crash, I'll just return. That's not because of the Q list view in QML is broken, but it could be that you had proxy models, and we have three videos for that coming up, that you had proxy models sitting in between, and they were broken, I was asking for something broken. So better safe than sorry and say, if you ask for that, I don't know. You could have done it with an assert. Uh, instead, that would have been just as fine, but just don't crash randomly because you didn't check up on those parameters. Of course, 
my data method could look very, very different. Here, I had the data built into my model. So I just went to my vector and got the data, the, the rows data element out, and I, I looked at which, um, which instance variable in that data struct should I return to the QML level. But it could have been that it was about satellites flying around the Earth again. So if I asked for the, the country, I would go and look up in my dictionary of, of my satellites and see, oh, that is, a, that is a from USSR. Well, I guess QML didn't exist back then. Or if it was talking about uh, what is the battery level on that, uh, that spaceship flying around Earth, then I would go and, and do a an, an, uh, uh, network connection to that satellite and ask the satellite for the data. So the data method could be very, very different from what you look. Just a word of warning, 90% of the time, your data method likely look very much like what you have on the screen. Now, if we look at the, uh, at the QML file, I have my list view, I got my delegate, my delegate got the image, it got the text, it got the mouse area here. So the image and the text, that is, do we still have it running? We don't, we will soon again. The image is what we have here and that is in a, that is anchored so that it sits on this side and the, the text is anchored so it sits next to it and that's all fine. Then with the mouse area and the mouse area allows me to duplicate whenever I click on the left mouse button. So there we are. Now we duplicated Sweden, right click, then I will make Sweden go away. Actually, let's make them all go away. This is a, uh, this is to all my friends out there from the US. You were all watching an HBO series called Vikings, so you all thought that we were Vikings in Denmark. And of course we were, I just forgot my helmet today. So now Denmark has some, have taken over all of Scandinavia. And you can see we are still populating. Now, what happened there was that I called on my model, I called duplicate data, so just to update my model with whatever method, whatever index I had there or remove data. And let's just go back to the model and see what we do there. So my duplicate data and my remove data, they need to do exactly the same thing. First of all, I test here, is it valid data? If not, then don't do anything that will make it crash. Then I'll go and say, okay, so you want to duplicate on this particular row. So it's just a queue in, it's just a queue invocable, this uh, duplicate, well, it's a slot, but it's the same thing. It's just, it, it's not something that's part of the model view API. It's just a method that I invented, right? So I'll, I'll call this, um, I'll go and ask for what data is on that row that you're interested in. And then I will figure out some, well, what's the row offset gonna be for the new one. And this part is the important part that now we're back in model view API. I need to tell, I need to call a virtual or not a virtual, I need to call a method that is called begin insert row just before I update my data structure. Then I need to update my data structure and then I need to call end insert row. It would be too, too much to discuss why, I just accept that that is the case. And what I do when I call begin insert row, I need to specify a model index. And for this model, it's always just a few model index and rows of insert that is where will the new data go. And that's whenever I call end insert row. When I call end insert row, the model will tell the view, why are some signals and slots? Hey, we actually got a new row at this position. And then the view would go down and ask the model for the data. You see the same here in remove row and that's, uh, that's the same thing. So now you actually know how to create a model that is a read-only model. If you want to make your model read-write, it is not much, but it's beyond what we'll be able to make in this video here. You will need to implement a set data method, so not just data, but also a set data. And you need to implement a flags method where you tell the view, yes, on this particular index, this particular row, I'm actually able to edit the data. So you can, on a row by row or a row, yeah, row by row basis, you can tell the view which data should be editable. Of course, you will, on the QML side, need to do this. There is no, 
there's no feature built into the queue list view for doing this. But if you assign to those properties, then they will be taken by the model on the C++ level. That's it for this video. We will end out with three videos now talking about proxy models. Proxy models is a truly very useful thing when you do model view. It helps you not only to keep your business logic on the C++ level, but also make sure that your models on the C++ level aren't gigantically big and able to do everything. There you'll be able to split the responsibility into a number of different classes. So stay tuned, do subscribe to our channels and all of that. And until next time, have a great time.